We're going to explore a story that's not just about ancient names and places, but about identity, history, and the legacy that shapes who we are today. So, let's start with Noah, a figure most of us know from the story of the flood. After the floodwaters receded, Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, embarked on a mission to repopulate the earth. Ham, one of Noah's sons, is a name that carries significant weight when we talk about the origins of African nations. Ham had four sons, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. Now, these names might sound ancient, but they are the keys to unlocking the roots of many African civilizations. Cush, for instance, is often linked to the region we know today as Ethiopia or the broader area of Nubia. Mizraim is traditionally associated with Egypt, Phut with Libya, and Canaan with the regions that later became the land of Israel. But this is where it gets really interesting. The Bible doesn't just list these names for the sake of it. These lineages are not random, they tell us where these nations came from, who their ancestors were, and by extension, who we are. When we talk about the African identity, we are talking about a lineage that goes back thousands of years to the very dawn of post-flood humanity. For far too long, the story of Ham's descendants has been overshadowed by a narrative that doesn't do justice to their real legacy. Too often, the biblical account has been twisted and used to justify oppression, with the so-called curse of Ham being wrongly applied to all of his descendants. But when we look closely at the text, the curse was specifically directed at Canaan, not Ham, and certainly not Cush, Mizraim, or Phut. So, when we talk about the origins of African nations, we need to do so with the respect and recognition they deserve. Let's focus on Cush for a moment. This is a name that reverberates through the pages of history. The Cushites were a powerful people, often referred to as Ethiopians in ancient texts. They were known for their wealth, their wisdom, and their strong cultural identity. Ethiopia is even mentioned in the Bible as a land of great significance, Isaiah speaks of it, Zephaniah prophesies about it, and the Psalms celebrate its influence. Mizraim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt, is another key player. We're talking about a civilization that gave us the pyramids, the Sphinx, and a culture that influenced the entire Mediterranean world. This is the land where Moses was born, where Joseph rose to power, and where the Exodus took place. The Egyptians were not just any people, they were the descendants of Mizraim, the son of Ham, making them part of this incredible African lineage. Phut, though less frequently mentioned, is associated with the region of Libya. This was a land known for its warriors, its connection to the Mediterranean, and its role in the broader history of Africa. Let's talk about one of the most misunderstood and misused stories in the Bible, the so-called Curse of Ham. This narrative has had a profound impact on how people view African descendants, but not in the way it should have. After the flood, Noah, who's just restarted civilization with his family, plants a vineyard, makes some wine, and, well, overindulges. He ends up drunk and naked in his tent. Now, this is where things start to spiral. Ham, one of his sons, sees his father in this compromised state and tells his brothers, Shem and Japheth, who respectfully cover Noah without looking at him. Here's where the twist comes in. When Noah wakes up and realizes what happened, he's furious, not with Ham, but with Ham's son, Canaan. And what does he do? He curses Canaan, saying that Canaan will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. Notice anything? That's right, Noah curses Canaan, not Ham. But somehow, over centuries, this has been twisted to imply that all of Ham's descendants, particularly those in Africa, were cursed. This misinterpretation has been used to justify some of the worst atrocities in history, including slavery and racial discrimination. Now, let's move to the heart of the problem. How did a curse on Canaan turn into a justification for the enslavement of African people? It's a story of manipulation, a twisting of scripture to fit the agenda of those in power. Over the centuries, this false narrative was perpetuated by theologians, colonialists, and even some church leaders who wanted to find a biblical justification for their actions. They conveniently ignored the fact that Canaan's descendants settled in the Middle East, not Africa, and that the curse was specific to Canaan, not Ham or his other sons like Cush or Mizraim, who are the ancestors of African peoples. 
So, how does this impact us today? The remnants of this misinterpretation still linger in cultural and racial stereotypes. It's a stain on history that needs to be acknowledged and corrected. By understanding the truth of this story, we can start to dismantle the harmful narratives that have been built around it. Now, let's connect this to a broader conversation. What does it say about how we use religious texts? The misuse of the Curse of Ham story is a powerful example of how religious texts can be twisted to serve harmful ideologies. It's a reminder that interpretation matters, who's interpreting, for what purpose, and with what understanding. Let's dive into Ethiopia, a land that's more than just a place on a map, it's a country with deep, biblical roots that run through some of the most powerful stories in the Bible. First, let's talk about the Queen of Sheba. This legendary figure, often associated with Ethiopia, made a journey that has fascinated scholars, historians, and theologians for centuries. She traveled to Jerusalem to meet King Solomon, bringing with her gold, spices, and precious stones. But she wasn't just there to trade, she came with questions, testing Solomon's wisdom, which was famous across the world. And guess what? Solomon answered every single one. This encounter wasn't just about diplomacy, it was a meeting of minds, a blending of cultures, and a recognition of Ethiopia's significance in the ancient world. The Queen of Sheba isn't just a footnote in history, she represents a powerful, intelligent, and wealthy nation that had a direct connection with one of the most revered kings in the Bible. But Ethiopia's role in the Bible doesn't stop with the Queen of Sheba. Fast forward to the New Testament, and we find another Ethiopian making waves in the biblical story, the Ethiopian eunuch. This man was a high-ranking official in the court of the Kandake, the queen of the Ethiopians, and he was on a journey of his own, this time to Jerusalem. As he traveled back home, he was reading from the book of Isaiah when Philip, one of the apostles, approached him. This encounter led to one of the earliest recorded baptisms of a non-Jewish believer in the Christian faith. The Ethiopian eunuch's conversion wasn't just a personal transformation, it was a symbol of the spread of Christianity beyond the borders of Israel, reaching into Africa and beyond. Ethiopia, once again, played a pivotal role in the expansion of a major world religion. Now, let's connect these stories to a broader context, Ethiopia as a symbol of prophecy and power in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, Ethiopia is mentioned as a land of people tall and smooth-skinned who bring gifts to God. Ethiopia isn't depicted as a distant, irrelevant place but as a nation with a significant role in the fulfillment of God's plans. The prophets saw Ethiopia as a land of promise, a place that would stand firm even when other nations fell. This idea of Ethiopia as a steadfast, enduring nation is echoed throughout the Bible, giving it a unique and honored position among the nations mentioned in the scriptures. But let's not stop there. Ethiopia's role in the Bible also challenges some of the narrow views people have about the origins and significance of African nations in the biblical world. It wasn't a backwater or an afterthought, it was a major player, a nation that was recognized for its wealth, wisdom, and spiritual significance. This challenges the often Eurocentric interpretations of the Bible that have dominated for so long. Ethiopia's prominence in the Bible is a powerful reminder that Africa's contributions to biblical history are not only significant, but foundational. Ethiopia's connection to the Bible goes even deeper when we consider the modern identity of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, one of the oldest Christian communities in the world. This church traces its origins back to the very stories we've been discussing, particularly the Ethiopian eunuch. The continuity of faith, culture, and identity from biblical times to today is something that very few nations can claim. Ethiopia stands as a testament to the enduring legacy of a nation that has been at the heart of some of the Bible's most powerful stories. Let's dive into the African presence in early Christianity, a story that's often overlooked but is absolutely central to the foundation of the Christian faith. When we talk about the roots of Christianity, most people think of Jerusalem, Rome, or Constantinople, but Africa, yes, Africa, played a crucial role in shaping what we now know as Christianity. First up, let's talk about one of the giants of Christian theology, Augustine of Hippo. Augustine wasn't just a theologian, he was a revolutionary thinker whose ideas about grace, free will, and original sin still influence Christian doctrine today. 
And here's the kicker, Augustine was African. Born in what is now Algeria, Augustine's African heritage was a vital part of his identity and intellectual framework. His writings, especially the Confessions and the City of God, are foundational texts that have shaped Western thought for centuries. Augustine didn't just contribute to Christianity, he helped define it. So, when we talk about the roots of Christian thought, we need to acknowledge that those roots are deeply embedded in African soil. Now, let's move to Tertullian, another African theologian whose impact on Christianity cannot be overstated. He was the first to use the term Trinity to describe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a concept that is now central to Christian belief. Tertullian's works laid the groundwork for much of the Church's doctrine, especially in the realm of apologetics, where he defended the Christian faith against Roman persecution and pagan criticism. And get this, Tertullian was writing in Latin, the same language that would later become the language of the Roman Church. So, not only was Tertullian African, but he was also a key figure in shaping the very theology that the Roman Church would later propagate. Connecting this to another giant, Athanasius of Alexandria, who fought tirelessly to defend the doctrine of the Trinity against the Arian heresy. Athanasius was from Egypt, and his relentless defense of Orthodox Christianity earned him the title Father of Orthodoxy. Without Athanasius, the Christian Church might look very different today, he was the one who stood up against the powerful forces of Arianism and helped solidify the belief in the Trinity as central to Christian doctrine. His African heritage wasn't just a footnote, it was central to his identity and his mission. But it wasn't just individual theologians, Africa was home to some of the earliest Christian communities. The Coptic Church in Egypt, for example, is one of the oldest Christian denominations in the world, tracing its origins back to the Apostle Mark. The Copts developed their own rich theological and liturgical traditions, contributing enormously to the diversity of early Christian practice. This wasn't some isolated group on the fringes of Christianity, this was a major center of Christian thought and practice right in Africa. And let's not forget the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which claims to have one of the oldest Christian traditions in the world, dating back to the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch mentioned in the Book of Acts. Ethiopia embraced Christianity early on and developed its own unique Christian traditions that have endured for centuries. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church's distinctive liturgy, music, and art are not just remnants of a distant past, they are living traditions that have been passed down through generations, keeping the African Christian legacy alive and vibrant. What does all this mean for how we understand Christianity today? It means that the African roots of Christianity are not just historical curiosities, they are central to the faith itself. The doctrines we hold, the scriptures we read, the very concept of the Trinity, all of these have deep connections to Africa. When we talk about the history of Christianity, we can't afford to overlook the African contribution. It's time to recognize that Africa wasn't just a passive recipient of the Christian message, it was an active, foundational part of its development. Let's explore a topic that's both intriguing and powerful, Africa's role in biblical prophecy, particularly in the context of the end times. Africa is more than just a backdrop in the biblical story, it plays a crucial role in the unfolding of God's plan for the world, especially as we approach the end of days. In the book of Isaiah, where we find Ethiopia mentioned as a land of great significance. In Isaiah 18, Ethiopia is described as a nation tall and smooth-skinned, a people feared far and wide, and a land divided by rivers. The passage goes on to speak of how Ethiopia will bring gifts to the Lord of Hosts in Mount Zion. What does this tell us? It suggests that Ethiopia, and by extension Africa, holds a place of honor in the fulfillment of God's promises. It's not a passive player, but an active participant in the divine plan, recognized for its strength, beauty, and significance. Moving forward, let's look at the book of Ezekiel, where Egypt, another African nation, is prominently featured in the prophecies concerning the last days. In Ezekiel 30, God declares that Egypt will be desolate among desolate lands, and its cities will lie in ruins for 40 years. This prophecy isn't just a judgment, it's a sign of the pivotal role that Egypt, and Africa, plays in the eschatological timeline. The fate of Egypt is tied to the fate of nations, illustrating how Africa's destiny is intertwined with the global unfolding of events as described in the Bible. But it doesn't stop there. 
In the book of Zephaniah, we see a prophecy that highlights God's plan for Africa in the restoration of his people. Zephaniah 3 verse 10 says, From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed people, shall bring me offerings. This verse speaks of a time when Africans will be among those who bring offerings to God, symbolizing their integral role in the worship and restoration of God's people. It's a powerful image of inclusion, showing that Africa is not on the margins of God's plan, but at the very heart of it. What's the takeaway here? Africa's role in biblical prophecy is not one of marginal importance, it's central, dynamic, and prophetic. The continent is repeatedly mentioned in the context of God's judgment, restoration, and ultimate plan for humanity. This challenges the often Eurocentric interpretations of the Bible that have dominated for centuries, reminding us that Africa's place in the biblical narrative is significant and should be recognized as such. So, what does this mean for us today? It means that Africa's spiritual legacy is not just a thing of the past, but is very much alive in the present and future. As we read and interpret the Bible, we must do so with an awareness of Africa's crucial role in the divine story. This isn't just about correcting historical oversights, it's about embracing the full scope of God's plan, which includes people from every nation, tribe, and tongue, including those from Africa. In closing, let's reflect on the words of Galatians 3 verse 28, which reminds us, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse encapsulates the spirit of equality and unity that runs throughout the Bible, calling us to recognize the equal value and importance of all people, regardless of their race or origin. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this discussion enlightening, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more deep dives into the Bible's rich and diverse history. God bless you all.